I'm going to talk about <clears throat> a double-blind placebo-controlled study of lithium versus placebo augmentation of enhanced usual care for preventing repeated suicide attempts in patients with depression or bipolar disorder. It's a stretch for an RCT. Um, it has the scientific rigor that we strive for, we think, but it really struggles for ecological validity. And I think that's why Dr. Simon asked me to talk about it. Um, we began planning for this study about 10 years ago. Uh, um, it's been a while. And at that time, lithium was an appropriate uh, 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 um, treatment for study. I suspect if we were to design a study for preventing suicide reattempts now, we would probably focus on uh, 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 some newer and more exciting agents. Um, I had some. Uh, disclosures here, but they really don't matter. What I really want to talk about is a bit of a confession, that when we designed this study, it was in part designed to be the best possible study uh, uh, for the area for preventing suicide attempts. But maybe even in larger part, we had to reverse engineer the study so it would fit within the context and ground rules of VA's cooperative study program. Uh, we had to get the study funded. For those of us who are advocates of suicide prevention in VA, it was really important to have a, a large-scale VA research in suicide prevention going, and that meant a cooperative multi-site study. So. Uh, um, what you're going to hear about is some of the stress and strain that came from that tension between what's the right way to address suicide prevention in a clinical trial versus how do you fit within the uh, uh, box of larger scale trials. Some background on lithium. Um, we began planning this, as I mentioned, about 10 years ago. Um, even at that time, the notion that lithium may be uh, um, active in preventing suicidal behavior in patients with bipolar disorder and depression was a decade or two old. There have been numerous observational studies and meta-analyses. Uh, um, all of these, though, are subject to a kind of negative indication bias, the notion being that everyone knows that lithium is dangerous in overdose, so providers may shy away from prescribing it whenever there's a whiff of suicide uh, in the air. So one has to look at these observational studies with, with some reservations. But there are also meta-analyses that include RCTs of lithium conducted for other outcomes that provide support for the hypothesis. A propensity matching study of bipolar patients in VA was equivocal. Um, the question is, is there enough evidence there from the meta-analyses primarily such that uh, the question is answered? And in fact, the VA DOD clinical practice guidelines for suicide prevention thought so, and they reference suicide as active. Uh, nevertheless, we were concerned recognizing the absence of any RCTs conducted specifically to test this outcome, proposed this, and the study uh, um, was implemented. Um, well, having decided that a suicide prevention clinical, randomized clinical trial was needed, the next question is, is it meaningfully feasible? Well, 
recent years, there were two large-scale clinical trials that were um, implemented and terminated early due to difficulties in communication. Uh, there's never been an adequately powered clinical trial. We argued, though, if it can be done anywhere, it can be done in VA. There's a large patient population, 140 or so medical centers, infrastructure for suicide prevention, and infrastructure for clinical trials. Um, So uh, um, we began the study. Um, the uh, uh, study so far has admitted about 360 people. It's powered uh, uh, to detect a 40% reduction in suicide rates uh, or suicide reattempt rates. The projected sample size is about 1,600, so we're struggling, even with 28 active sites for randomizing. But there are questions about ecological validity beyond difficulties in recruitment. One, uh, and the most fundamental, might be how much of a filter is an RCT for uh, enrolling people who are truly at risk for suicide. Uh, um, suicide attempts are conditions of behavioral discontrol, uh, surely uh, um, getting involved in consenting to an RCT filters out many of these people. Our electronic medical records demonstrated that among those with depression or bipolar disorder who survive a suicide attempt, 15% reattempt during the year. So we powered on that number. The question is, uh, uh, um, what do we see in the study as conducted? Well, surprisingly, we see about the same number. So far, it's about 15%. Frankly, we expected far higher. The electronic medical record is the electronic medical record, and how an attempt gets in there is uh, vague, even in the presence of a system designed to enhance the sensitivity for detection. But in the clinical trial, at each encounter, uh, uh, um, every week or two early on, then every month or so later on, we're asking very specifically using standardized questions about suicide behavior. We would have expected that to uncover additional attempts. It did not. It was really surprising and a puzzle to us until we recently took a look at another VA project. We've recently begun surveying patients entering mental health services really to get intention to treat data with repeated measures looking at outcomes. Uh, the goal is to, um, uh, for quality and program evaluation purposes, take a look at outcomes independent of whether patients continue in care. Well, in that study, we examined uh, uh, attempt rates and found that they really did, in fact, dramatically exceed the medical record rates. Uh, only about half of the attempts reported in these uh, uh, survey questions were actually uh, uh, demonstrated in the medical record. So we now think that the notion that 15% were found in the record and 15% were found in the study is a coincidence and we're probably dealing with counterbalancing effects. Increased ascertainment from the uh, uh, repeated measures interviews and filtering due to the uh, uh, RCT process. Other issues we had to deal with in the design of the study are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, with respect to diagnoses, uh, 
Um, most RCTs clearly admit clean patients. Well, the clean patients aren't those at risk for suicide. Uh, one of the major decisions in design was to allow comorbidities, uh, primarily in PTSD, uh, um, substance use and PTSD comorbidity. Substance use was allowed as a comorbidity unless it, there was an active requirement for medically supervised detoxification. Uh, there was no attempt to filter out primary versus secondary diagnosis. Any coexisting depression counted. There were also questions about comorbidities and concomitant medications. Uh, diuretics and ACE inhibitors uh, raise lithium levels and make it more difficult to manage patients on lithium. Um, we tried to get them included in the design initially uh, uh, with extra monitoring, but the review group and IRB quashed that. Though as the study began, we found that 30% of otherwise eligible patients were excluded specifically because they were on ACE inhibitors. That was remarkable. We argued to the IRB that we really had to include them if there was going to be any chance for the subject sample to be representative of the true patient population who survived an attempt, and they agreed. Uh, uh, but there was a good deal of time lost for this. I want to skip effect size and talk about monitoring because uh, uh, one of the major features of the VA's cooperative study program is a really good monitoring group. Actually, this is uh, an earlier version of these slides. I apologize. Uh, uh, it says flexibility is important in care of patients and trials. Uh, Greg urged me to say uh, flexibility is essential but difficult. I sent you the wrong version of the slides, and I really apologize for that. Uh, I can't describe any specific patients, but I can tell you about an issue that occurred in a similar clinical trial long ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, the study conducts um, and requires lithium levels weekly during titration, monthly during the first six months, and then quarterly thereafter, and assessments about every two weeks. Uh, one patient, a 38-year-old man, entered, consented, and was difficult. He had depression, concomitant PTSD, and probably a personality disorder. He was difficult and was late for appointments, missed appointments, but... Um, Boy, the study team at the site worked very hard to keep him in the protocol. And he did, in fact, follow the protocol until the fifth month when he came for a blood level but just didn't make it in for the assessments. He was in phone contact with the investigators probably a couple times a week, but just never made it in. And this continued into the six months where he missed both the blood test and the assessments. Um, the investigators, following what they considered was good clinical management, continued to send the patient uh, uh, supplies of study medication every two weeks by mail. That's the standard procedure. And when the monitor came around, um, they criticized this harshly, judging that this was a serious protocol violation. How could they send out the medication without the six-month blood level? The investigator argued that patients at risk for suicide are complex and have trouble meeting protocols, that VA's procedures for clinical care using lithium require blood tests only every six months, and that he was following good clinical 
management strategies by working to keep I, I was careful not to say good clinical practice there. He knows the difference between those two things. Sorry, I had to say that. Uh, exactly. And that's precisely the issue. Uh, um, he was um, uh, um, noted to have a serious protocol violation. He argued no, he was trying to manage the patient in the best possible way. Um, he appealed the judgment, and what happened doesn't really matter. But the question is, does the protocol fit the patient, or does the patient have to fit the protocol? Uh, um, and that's especially important in a complex and clinically difficult situation like suicide prevention. Thank you.